Thank you so much. So we're so excited to continue to host this series with uh, the PMD Alliance uh, giving us this amazing platform. So thank you, Sarah, and your lovely team for continuing to give us a space to gather. And uh, we're still sadly physically distanced, but hopefully we're getting one step closer to being um, able to be together. And uh, hopefully you're all staying socially connected. As you know, that that is sort of a passion of mine recently. So reach out to your friends and family and just check in and see if everyone's okay. So, so excited to have uh, Patrick Brendan uh, today. Um, he is the director of the Center for Neurodegenerative Science and the J. Van Andel Endowed Chair at the Van Andel Research Institute in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, and he's really just this amazing leader in research and sort of advocacy, kind of out of the box thinking uh, with um, this institute and sort of the work that he's doing. I really love uh, the way that they have been able to connect the patient voice and um, sort of the the research sort of community and, you know, just sort of really staying at the cutting edge of what's happening in the world of um, Parkinson's research. And um, so maybe um, uh, without further ado, maybe I'll have um, Patrick teach us a little bit about his journey, how he ended up in Michigan, because he's not originally from there. He's uh, actually Swedish. So um, teach us a little bit about your background, your training. I know you spent some time in Lund and uh, um, have, have been kind of, um, you know, sort of, uh, it's, it's been a little bit of a path to get to, to Michigan, but I think you've really found a, an amazing place to settle and you've built a beautiful institute there with a lot of great minds together. Thank you. So uh, if you want to, I can tell my whole story. It is a story. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's about 40 years long, actually longer than that. So when you I was about, <laughs> yeah, you, please don't hesitate to interrupt me because it, but I hope it will be worth listening to anyway, because it has many twists and turns. So when I was about 13 years old, uh, my family, my parents and my sister, we lived in the United Kingdom and we used to go skiing one week per year. And in 1973 or 74, we went to Austria. And for the first time ever in my life, I saw my father fall in a ski slope. We weren't great skiers by any standards, but he typically wouldn't fall. And he fell several times during this one week trip. Mm -hmm. And we got worried and concerned what was going on. And my mother, who, who also was worried, decided we had to go to a doctor. And long story short, he ended up with a neurologist. We were in the Northeast of England. In, Darlington and he went to Middlesbrough and he was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease just a few weeks after this ski trip and I remember my mother and I get a little bit uh, emotional about it when I think about it but I remember my mother saying that uh, they were happy that there was a drug that could treat the disease this was in the beginnings of L-DOPA because this is early 1974 so L-DOPA hadn't been around so long and Dr. Saunders was the name of a neurologist, I still remember this, but he, he had said to my mother that this disease treats the symptoms, but we're not sure that it does anything for the progression of the disease. And maybe they weren't sure, or maybe he knew, but my mother described that he had blushed when he'd said this. So, so this was a very difficult time in our lives. And uh, my father lost his job in England. We had to move home in 75. And uh, the whole family started then living back in Sweden, where we were all originally from. So um, at that point in life, I knew that I wanted to be a doctor of some sort. And I was very fortunate to get a scholarship to go back to the United Kingdom. I ended up in a place called the United World College of the Atlantic, which is in southern Wales. Uh, and it's actually in this beautiful castle from the 12th century called St. Donat's Castle. And since we're in America, I can tell you that Win William Randolph Hearst owned this as one of his summer residencies. Uh, so we studied in rooms called the Hearst Room, which was his bedroom, or Mary and Davis Room, his lover's bedroom. Uh, and we lived in this beautiful setting. But of course, my father was deteriorating, as, as uh, one will do with Parkinson's. And when I went there in 1978, I decided I wanted to do part of my high school diploma on Parkinson's. And I did a diploma called International Baccalaureate, IB. Some of you may know it. It's quite uh, widely spread in, in the US now, but then it was a rare thing. You could do this diploma in, in a few places. And you have to do an extended essay and you can choose any subject you want. And I went to my biology teacher, Mr. Date, 
Richard Date, I said to Mr. Date, well, I want to do it in Parkinson's disease. And uh, Dickie Date said to me, that's not a good idea, Patrick. And I said, why? And well, you, it's too close to you. You shouldn't do it. Um, but I, um, I prevailed. And <laughs> I said I wanted to do it. And eventually, uh, the doctor who took care of all the students, we were 360 students from 60 different countries in this castle, he uh, put me in touch with a scientist and, uh, in Cardiff, at Cardiff University. So some 25 miles away, there was a neuropharmacologist called John Davis. And he said he would take me under his wings and let me do this extended essay. And I was 17 years old. It was very nice of him. So I uh, went to Cardiff and I did a project. I, I did some animal experiments and saw if I could create an animal model of Parkinson's. And remember, I was 17. So I poisoned them with manganese in the drinking water. It's not as horrible as it sounds. Uh, they looked normal at the end of this experiment. Uh, but I knew from the literature I'd read that people who do manganese mining can get Parkinsonism. And there I am, I do this, and then I, I did some tests on them, and I saw that under certain circumstances with, with pharmacological stimulation, they were a little, little bit Parkinsonistic, and I could reverse it with L-dopa. And at that point, I was writing up my essay. I stayed a couple of extra weeks in the summer and over my Christmas vacation to do this project. And just then, there was a scientific paper in the journal Science actually came out in August in 1979, or May 79. But I, I, I spotted this and it said, it might be possible to repair brains using transplants of brain cells. And this was a American Swedish group who transplanted cells and said they could reverse Parkinson's symptoms in rats. And I read about this and I thought I'll put that as the very final paragraph in my extended essay. And it's entitled, A Look Into the Future, this paragraph, and I still remember it. And I said that this might be possible to do in humans in the future. So I end my essay. So I submitted my essay, I got my high school diploma and I, I of course, I wanted to go to medical school because in Sweden you can go directly from high school to medical school. And I ended up at Lund University. Just a sidebar, Lund University, and all of you need to know this, was the place where L-Dopa was discovered by Arvid Carlson. So Arvid Carlson in 1958 had discovered that L-Dopa could reverse Parkinson's symptoms in rabbits, where he had induced the symptoms. Arvid Carlson moved from Lund to Gothenburg a few years later, and then in 2000, he won, guess what? The Nobel Prize. So Lund never got credit for it, but there is a little bronze plaque outside the Department of Farm College here saying, this is the building where the experiment was done. Anyway, I ended up there. I wasn't aware of Eric Carlson at the time. Um, but I, in my first semester, I had a lecturer called Anders Björklund. He, he was teaching us about the pituitary gland. And he talked a little bit about dopamine because you can find some dopamine in the pituitary. For some reason, I ended up during one of the breaks, going up to him, asking him something. We chatted a little bit. Turned out that I found out that he'd worked on transplants of brain cells in Parkinson rats. So I went home and I, I pulled out my photocopies of the papers I'd written about and and he was cited in one of the papers. So I thought, was super excited, thinking, oh, I have a teacher here who's, who's actually worked on the thing that I thought was a look into the future. So I asked him, can I, can I come to an evening class? Because they had evening classes in research. Remember, I'm still at that point in time, 18 years old. Uh, so I joined this evening class. And then a few months later, and we're almost celebrating the 40th anniversary right now, 1st of April, 1981. I signed up in his group as a junior teacher, and it allowed me to get a bit of cash, and I could do research on weekends and, and evenings. So Artis Bjorklin became my supervisor whilst I was pursuing my MD. And just as another interesting sidebar, I saw Anders Bjorklund about four hours ago in a Zoom, He's now 75, 
and he's still active in this field. And we had this wonderful global meeting last night and this morning with people from Japan, Singapore, Sweden, United Kingdom, US, all in one Zoom. And Anders was on this call. But anyway, I joined him. I started doing work in his group. Uh, I took a break from my medical training in 1983 and, and pursued a PhD. So I did an MD PhD. Meanwhile, my father still had Parkinson's and he was following uh, the progressive course and, and um, um, had to quit his, the job that he finally got a job in Sweden and he had to quit that job. And we started discussing whether we could translate the work we'd done in rats into humans. And I was very fortunate in 1985 to join this team when I was a kid, literally. I'm in 1985 and I'm still 23. So we started planning these first brain cell transplants in humans. And my job was to work out the, the technique in rats uh, in a way that we could transfer it to humans. So that's what we did. And uh, I, I had the idea that uh, uh, the final paper in my thesis was going to be that we succeeded, but fate took another course. So we did our first clinical surgeries in 1987. We operated two people with Parkinson's in Lund in Sweden with immature neurons. We transplanted them into the brain and tried to restore the lost functions. But we found out after six to 12 months that the transplants didn't really work. And all the work we'd done in animals was fine. But when we had gone into humans, we had change the instrument we used. So we inject these through a, a small hole in the head. We make a burr hole. And we inject them with a fine needle. When planning the surgery, and I still have the plans right next to me somewhere. I wasn't planning on showing them, but anyway, they're here in this room. When planning the surgery, we drew an instrument. Everything was hand done, drawn in those days. That was going to be about a millimeter in outer diameter. Our neurosurgeon, Stieg Reinkruna, who's in his late 70s today, he went off and made an instrument in the workshop. We had a, a guy in the workshop make it. What we never did is check what happened to the instrument. He was happy with it. Technically, it looked good, but it had grown from one millimeter to two and a half millimeter in outer diameter. So it turned out that we'd use an instrument that wasn't good for transplant surgery because it, it caused some local damage. So let's fast forward. I present my thesis in 1988. And guess who came to my dissertation? Well, it was on May 21st, 1988. On May 20th, 1988, we had given an award to Arvid Carlson uh, for his work in, on L-Dopa and neurobiology. So he was in Lund and he had family in Lund. So he stayed overnight till Saturday, May 21st. So he came to my dissertation. That was kind of cool. But of course, he was just a regular professor then. He hadn't won the Nobel Prize. That was 12 years before. But um, we failed. So we'd failed in these first two patients. And therefore, I decided not to go back to medical school after my PhD. I decided to stay on, stayed on for a couple of years. And we tried to figure out what, what had gone wrong. And, and we soon came up on this instrument thing. We redesigned it, made a thinner instrument. and we started surgeries again in the spring of 1990. So it didn't take us more than a couple of years. That sounds like a short time, but of course, if you are young, it's an eternity. Uh, I, I thought it was a long time, but <laughs> we did the surgeries in, in early 1990 and lo and behold, success. And what does that mean? Transplants survived. We could see them on positron positron emission tomography, PET scans. And the patients showed signs of improvement, which was sensational stuff. So I was in the middle of this crazy world with, uh, this was before internet and email. So, but we had journalists from all over the world coming to visit a little Lund in the south of Sweden. And it was very exciting. We even operated a couple of patients from California who'd got Parkinsonism induced by a drug called MPTP. So they flew over from California and we did the surgery later in 1990 in the fall. 
And this was a tremendously exciting period to grow up in. And I then decided I want to be a neurologist. So I went back to medical school and I, I was about to embark on a neurology training program. I just started, in fact. And then I got a grant that in 1994 now, so we're fast forwarding. We continued to do surgeries. We changed some parameters, tried to improve the technology. Um, but then I got a grant that allowed me to go back and do basic research and start my own group. So I would, wouldn't be Anders Birkeland's postdoc anymore. Uh, and I decided to do that for three years. And my job was to try to improve the survival of these cells because we knew that the patients might do even better if we could get more of the cells to survive when we implanted them. And uh, then after three years, they said, you can have another three years of this amazing, huge grant. I got a very nice big grant. And then six years had passed, so we're now in the year 2000. And I realized I'm not going back to become a medical doctor. This is fun, exciting, and it's hard to do two things at the same time. So I stayed on and I've done so ever since. And um, I'm now gonna fast forward another 10 years. So in 2008, uh, two patients out of the 18 patients we had operated had passed away. And they'd passed away of natural causes unrelated to the transplant. One of them had lived 16 years with this transplant and another one had lived 12 years, I think it was. So this was a very long time. And we said to the families, would we be allowed to look at your, your spouse's brain? Because we would want to know if the transplanted cells are still there. So we were able to look in a microscope in the brains of these patients. And we were very excited that transplanted cells were still doing well. They looked healthy. They had lots of axons, these processes. And they were making dopamine, or at least they had the machinery to make dopamine. And then I remember another special day in August 2007, it must have been, when my then assistant professor, Jai Li, called me and he said, you know, I've looked at this transplant, looks wonderful, except when I... I stained the patient's brain for a protein called alpha-synuclein. And some of you have heard about this protein. It's a protein that makes clumps that we call Lewy bodies that are characteristic of Parkinson's disease. And Jai Lee, my assistant professor, stained the brains because he wanted to ensure it was Parkinson's disease. You know, we want to check everything. So he's looking and he saw Lewy bodies in the patient's brain. So it's Parkinson's disease. But then he saw Lewy bodies inside the transplants. And as a result of that, we said, this is crazy. These transplanted cells are young. Something strange has happened. They're only 10, 15 years old since we did the surgery. You don't get Parkinson's when you're 10 or 15 years old. So somehow this sick clumped up protein had moved from the patient's brain into the young, healthy, transplanted cells. And we immediately recognized that we we're onto something fundamentally important. We weren't looking for it. It was what we call serendipity. You know, it's Alexander Fleming opening the drawer, seeing that the bacteria didn't grow where the fungus sorry, was. I don't know that. Oh, sorry, my Alexa speaking. Alexa just said, sorry, I don't know that. Well, Alexa, Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin. There we are. So anyway, what we discovered uh, by chance is that alpha synuclein can move between cells. And we started speculating, can this be a mechanism that drives the disease? So we all know on this call that Parkinson's disease can start with a slight tremor or a stiffness in an arm, but then it gets worse over time. So what we started speculating immediately was that this protein was moving between cells, making patients worse. And we call this a prion-like process. Prions are proteins that cause mad cow disease, or some of you might know chronic wasting disease in deer, and there are a variety of rare disorders. And we said that maybe alpha-synuclein 
is acting like a prion, a proteinaceous infectious particle. It's almost like a virus. So this alpha synuclein makes a clump somewhere in the body and then it moves from there around the brain. And this totally changed my research around 2008, we published this together with my colleague then in Chicago, Jeff, Jeff Cordova, who found something similar in an American patient. And as a couple of years later, I was call, got a call or an email from Grand Rapids, the Van Andel Institute wanted to set up a research program on Parkinson's. And uh, my wife said to me, you should do it. You've been for 30 years in the same place and just go for it and see how it is. And if, if it isn't good, we'll come back after a few years. So we moved our then three kids, we now have four, and our dog at the time. And my wife was a psychiatrist, got a job here, and here we are. And I've since then done a lot of my work focused on this prion idea. And I can explain if you want to know how this is affected or how we think about Parkinson's. But meanwhile, in the background, I'm now pursuing the use of stem cells as a source of cells that one can transplant and stem cells that can be made from skin or from blood that we then can convert in the laboratory to brain cells. So those are two major things. And based on our understanding of what causes Parkinson's, I've been involved here at the Van Andel Institute in a new program for 10 years in research, things that are 10 years old are new. Isn't that strange? And if you win a, an award for a being young scientist, you can be 45 years old. Tell me another place in the world where you're young when you're 45. Things are very slow. Anyway, so uh, uh, because of my interest in what causes Parkinson's, together with Cure Parkinson's, or it used to be called Cure Parkinson's Trust in London, we set up a program to repurpose drugs for Parkinson's disease. So it's called the Link Clinical Trials Program. So that's another activity we have here. And I can talk a little bit later, maybe if you want to into about our relationship with Cure Parkinson's Trust, also when it comes to engaging patient advocates, because this is how I met the, the great and late Tom Isaacs, who a, was a, one of the founders of Cure Parkinson's, an amazing, man uh, who sadly passed away in 2017. Wow, that's amazing. I love that story. So cool. So you were inspired by your dad and moved to a castle and I, it's like just a really cool story. I think uh, your kids will love to watch this video someday and you know, <laughs> hear, hear their papa you know, telling these cool stories. And you remember all these teachers' names. And I was just thinking like, dude, would I remember like my teacher in grade 10 and what they said to me? But yeah, that's a really amazing- I'm story. actually still in contact with a couple of them. So that's the amazing thing. So, so teachers who inspired me in my high school, a couple of them were still alive. Uh, we were friends on Facebook. So it's, it's an actually great experience to be able to share this. And I, since you mentioned this, John Davis, who was this kind neuropharmacologist who let this idiot 17 year old, that's me, into his lab in August in 1979. I met him in Paris in 2001 or 2002 at the, uh, a large neuroscience meeting with like 3000 people. And I gave a big talk there and he comes up, walks up to me afterwards and says, do you know who I am? And I was kind of was struggling and said, I'm John Davis. Oh my God, I, said, I really owe you a lot of thanks. And, and we took a picture, my, my friend Jai Lee, the assistant professor took a picture, which actually uh, didn't work out because he had the wrong setting on the digital <laughs> camera. So there you are, but so I don't have a picture, but oh, there no. was such a wonderful moment and he had just retired then. So John Davis is another person I owe a lot to because you know, to let a 17 year old, yep. you know, Say, uh, I understand your emotional drive, you do whatever you want. Yeah, no, I think it's always great to find inspiration and through these um, conversations with, you know, honestly, world leaders, it's been amazing, you know, international world leaders in our field. I've, I've found tremendous inspiration from their own stories and I, things that I would never have asked had it not been for this sort of uh, opportunity. So it's, uh, thank you for sharing that. It was very personal and really beautiful. So I think you, you're really gifted at breaking down, I think, some of these 
very complex ideas um, and teaching them to me because I don't have a huge science background. So I'm assuming our patients are uh, really learning a lot from this as well. Um, so I would like to spend a few minutes and I, I, I do want to get to, you know, certainly the, the advocacy and the patient voice collaborations at the Van Andel and um, even with, uh, you know, the Journal of Parkinson's disease and your work there. Um, so we'll leave that to a little bit later on. But since you've, you've mentioned these two er areas, um, I do want to sort of go down both of those, um, you know, to some, uh, maybe spend five, 10 minutes um, sort of pursuing these chats around um, the prion hypothesis, I think is super complicated. And I think the gut comes in there and people start That's to true. go off. And so maybe let's go down that and maybe you could just break it down, you know, sure. as we've done just now, um, simple, you know, sort of uh, ability for patients to understand. Yeah. So, so when we found these clumps of protein inside the transplanted cells, we were aware that a neuropathologist called Hago Brock in Germany had just a few years earlier, about five years earlier, uh, suggested that Parkinson's disease might actually start in the gut or in the olfactory system, so in the nose. I'm sorry, the dogs are barking. Can I close the door just a moment? <laughs> Yes, yeah, so Heiko Brach had found clumps of alpha synuclein, so-called Lewy bodies, in parts of the nervous system that are very close to the nose, and he'd found them also in the nerves that innervate the gut. And he and his uh, co-workers suggested that maybe the disease process starts in one or two of these places, or, or both. And um, they didn't know why it would move from there to the brain, but they suggested maybe the disease is a virus of some sort that enters the nerve and, and that's how, how this change spreads across the brain. And he suggested that there are six stages in Parkinson's disease if one looks at the brain in a microscope. And the, the very first stage doesn't have any loss of dopamine neurons and no pathology at all in the dopamine system. It's only until you get to the third stage in his sixth stage are actually dopamine neurons lost. So it coincided with a group of clinicians led by Ron Postuma and Daniela Berg at the Movement Disorder Society around 2010 saying, hey, people with Parkinson's disease have symptoms long before we diagnose them. And they are frequently constipation, loss of sense of smell. And then there are a couple of other things, uh, sleep disorder, uh, anxiety and depression are other typical features. But constipation, loss of sense of smell, that sounds a lot like it could be stuff going on in the nose, nervous system, the olfactory system, and the gut. So we got very interested in this right on at the beginning, and we said uh, perhaps there is an insult, something, an insult like uh, an environmental toxin or an infection or something that if attacks the gut or and attacks the nose. And then it spreads from there. So we started modeling this. We, I say now my research group, and then quickly many, many other research groups jumped onto this. And in the last 10 years, we as a research field have shown that if you inject clumps of alpha synuclein into the gut, it will be transported along a nerve called the vagal nerve to the brain, and it will cause this Lewy pathology all over the brain. Similarly, if you inject the same type of clump into the nose, into the olfactory bulb of a mouse, spreads from there to about 40 to 50 brain regions within a year. So it's more or less, if not definitive proof of the prion-like hypothesis, very strong evidence that this can occur. And we're beginning to think then that the very, very beginnings of Parkinson's disease occurs in parts of the nervous system that are in touch with the outside world. And our gut is in touch with the outside world. And of course, everything we inhale affects the nose, the olfactory system. So, so we're exposed to things we believe that trigger the disease there. So that's really been a huge interest of mine uh, in the last 10 years and, and many other scientists, of course, also. Thank you. 
And what's your take on, because I know this group really likes to ask about the gut microbiome. So um, do you think that we can modulate that to change that prion hypothesis? Do you think the prion hypothesis gut entry portal stuff is happens like at birth or way too early to have any real ability to modulate any of this once you've figured out that you might be at risk for Parkinson's? So great question. So first of all, I think the answer to to the two parts of your question is we don't really know. So so is the gut microbiome play a role in this? We don't know, and we don't know when, if it does, when would it play a role? But the, here's a guess. I think the gut microbiome might modulate the risk for the disease by promoting or inhibiting the, the formation of protein clumps. And uh, when this occurs, uh, my guess would be relatively early in life. So if we think that people may have prodromal symptoms for five to even 20 years in some cases, and if, if they're diagnosed at age 50, 60, we're talking about things that happen maybe when they were 30, 40 years old. So that's going to be a challenge to figure out. And that's a, a guess that it's triggered then. It doesn't mean that changing uh, the way the gut works and, and this protein is folding later in life is as unimportant. It may be important because maybe there's synuclein being pushed up into the brain all the time and feeding this mechanism. We just don't know. Yeah. And when it comes to the gut microbiome, I have to also say that it's pretty clear that people with Parkinson's have changes in gut microbiome. And I say pretty clear because it's awfully difficult to study. Uh, but the problem is we don't know if it's due to the disease if the disease changes the way the gut moves, perhaps the microbiome will change. Or if it's related to medication, because it's very hard to study this in people who don't have medication, there aren't that many around. But there are really interesting new data sets emerging. And, and we have so, had somebody who sadly passed away uh, in a car accident in August in our institute, Vivian Labrie, who was doing some really exciting work on gut microbiome. And, and um, I just hope somebody can pick up the baton where she left off because she was seeing some interesting changes there. Absolutely. Um, and I know that was a great loss for you. So I'm yeah. sorry to hear that. Um, so there, this is a very smart group, our, our audience here. They have asked actually about the brain fables work of um, Alberto Espy and that whole scene. Uh, just maybe quickly not to get down that that's a rabbit hole that we will possibly never come back from, but maybe get your sense of a little bit of that, um, you know, and, and well, your thoughts. First of all, Alberto and I are great friends, and I'm very happy he's not here, because if we started discussing this, we'd go on for 10 hours. But, so, you know, maybe the we brain can have paper. a debate series, though, and I don't know oh, if you wow. saw his video. Um, just for a shout out to the gang out there, Alberto does a beautiful puppet show with a bunch of cushions and a blanket from his uh, couch and other environs. Um, so you can watch that video. If we'll link it. Here. I think it's absolutely w wonderful because I've seen bits of it on your YouTube. <laughs> uh, so uh, story, long story short, Alberto doesn't think these protein clumps are that important. They, um, he's saying that that's not part of the causative mechanism of Parkinson's. He doesn't deny that they exist, but he, he thinks actually what they might do is that they, they deplete uh, normal protein. So they remove synuclein and, and therefore make it worse. Um, so the brain fable story is, is valid. And we don't know if, if the Lewy bodies are actually causing the disease in the sense that they are underlying uh, cell death and so on. What would argue in favor of that being the case is that if we look at animal models and when we inject this protein and we get these protein clumps, brain cells actually do die in animal models. And before they die, if we put in electrodes and measure their activity, we can see that they change their activity. So for example, in the olfactory system, they, mice that are exposed to odors, the electrical activity is not normal if they have aggregates or, or the system doesn't have that. So that supports that those aggregates may have a causative role. Furthermore, there are some rare mutations in the gene for alpha synuclein. So very rare cases of Parkinson's or Parkinsonism are due to mutations in that gene or just having an extra copy of the gene. That evidence would suggest that alterations in, in that protein drive the disease because they get something that looks like Parkinson's. But I think uh, on the other hand, Alberto and, and uh, Ben Stescher who wrote Brain Fables argue 
uh, it, fairly and well that, uh, for example, in Alzheimer's disease, all the immunotherapy trials have failed and there'd be a number now more or less failed. So depleting, trying to get rid of protein aggregates that occur in Alzheimer's hasn't worked. With Parkinson's, we don't know yet. There's been one trial that has failed recently, but, but we just don't know. I don't think we can say either or. Um, Fair enough. So, so um, it's like science should be, right? It has to be a dialogue where we test each other's ideas and, and pit them against each other. If I had to put my own private savings on the bank and put a bet on something, my bet is I think actually alpha synuclein and Parkinson's does play a role in the disease process. And I think getting rid of it or getting rid of the clumps might be good. Now, having said that, Alpha synuclein must have a daytime job. Alpha synuclein isn't there just to cause Parkinson's disease, right? So the question is, what is its daytime job? And that's an interesting question because until recently, we have thought that alpha synuclein's primary daytime job has been to help neurochemicals be released from nerve cells so they can talk to each other. So two nerve cells talk to each other in something called the synapse. And alpha synuclein seems to be involved in the little vesicles that contain neurochemicals like dopamine when they're released and so on. However, recently we've begun, and we, I say now as a research field, to ask the question, could alpha synuclein have more than one daytime job? Or does it have a daytime and a nighttime job? And one of those jobs might be to respond to infections. And this seems a bit odd. But there's a scientist in Colorado called David Beckham, and he's not the soccer player uh, from England. He's a, an American virologist. He's just as great a virologist as David Beckham was a soccer player. But David Beckham saw that if you infect mice with a virus and used a virus called West Nile virus that you find in mosquitoes, if you infect mice with a this, this virus, alpha synuclein levels go up. So brain cells produce lots of alpha synuclein. So they're responding to this infection. And he also saw that if you remove alpha synuclein from brain cells and you expose them to a virus in a cell culture dish, they're more likely to die. So two hints here. Virus increases the amount of alpha synuclein. If you've removed alpha synuclein using genetic engineering, brain cells become more susceptible to virus. So is alpha synuclein actually trying to stop the virus somehow? Is that part of its job? Then he did another experiment where he injected the whole mouse with virus, and he took other mice that also didn't have alpha synuclein, genetically engineered mice. And what he saw was that in the mice that were normal mice that got the virus, maybe one in five or so got really sick with West Nile and they had encephalitis, brain inflammation. 100% of the ones that lacked synuclein got really sick. So synuclein acted like some kind of gatekeeper trying to stop West Nile virus from getting into the brain. And why is this a particularly hot topic? Can you imagine? Because of COVID. Because of COVID. And it's not like COVID is the only disease that's a virus disease. Or we know that hepatitis C is a virus disease. And we know that people who have had hepatitis C have an increased risk of Parkinson's later in life. And we also know that people who've had hepatitis C but were treated with antiviral, anti-hep C, do not have the same increased risk. So this is lurking in the background, this notion that viruses might be involved in the start of Parkinson's. And in do you know what I want to talk about now? Because there are three cases yeah. of people. I think there's developed. four, maybe. Is it three? I thought yeah, well, I, I, it's true. There's a fourth case in Sweden that hasn't been formally published. Maybe there's another one that I haven't heard of. But but there are three, three published cases that I know of, one in Brazil, one in Spain, one in Israel. Yeah. Yep. And then young people. Sweden. Yeah, well, there's this guy in Sweden who's only been on the news. I haven't seen yeah. a scientific okay. paper. But uh, the fascinating thing is that these three were people were relatively 
young. It's tragic and fascinating at the same time. Um, relatively young in the age of sort of 35, 55, no prior family history of Parkinson's, no constipation, loss of sense of smell before they got COVID. And yet within, I think it was 10 to about 30 days of getting COVID sufficiently severe to require hospitalization, all three of these people came down with Parkinson's symptoms. And it's called Parkinsonism when you can't say that it's the disease because this is not normal, right? You don't go from being, well, Parkinson's I guess isn't normal, but, but this is strange. Within a few weeks from being a normal person, being able to move around to pretty severely Parkinsonia. All of them had lost their sense of smell because of COVID. All of them had brain scans that showed the dopamine uh, was depleted. So consistent with Parkinsonism. Two of them got Parkinson meds like the ones that many of you are taking and responded well. The third person actually recovered spontaneously. Mm. So does SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, can that cause Parkinson's disease or Parkinsonism? Well, these three cases suggest that's, that is the case, but it's very rare. And we can't say we know why. One clue is that alpha synuclein might be upregulated in the brain if you have severe COVID. And there is an unpublished report of this. Two weeks ago, a Dutch group injected 12 monkeys with, uh, well, eight monkeys with, with the virus, SARS-CoV-2, and four monkeys were injected with some controlled substance. The eight monkeys who got SARS-CoV-2 all had Louis Baudet-like changes in their brains. The four who didn't get that, but just got a controlled thing, no Louis body like changes. So that paper isn't published yet. It's on one of those med archives or bio archives, but it's out there to read. So as scientists, we, we want things to be what we call peer reviewed before we, we trust them a little bit more. We can't even trust peer reviewed stuff, but, <laughs> but um, just to warn you, it's possible that SARS-CoV-2 can cause Louis pathology. Now, there are two other things that might happen in the brain of people with severe COVID. One is that I think you all know it's a horrible inflammation for people who get it badly. And it's, it, there's something called a cytokine storm in the body. Lots of inflammation. And inflammation is associated with Parkinson's. Inflammatory bowel disease increases Parkinson risk. So maybe that's the cause. Third possibility, we sadly know that COVID can cause vascular damage all over the body. So many organs and brain is no exception. And it's been shown that the brains of people who died with COVID, but not with Parkinsonism, but just with COVID, often have small vascular lesions, like little tiny strokes. And maybe that is the explanation. If those vascular lesions end up in the brain where the dopamine neurons are, that could explain it. So three possible experiments. Really interesting. Um, just on the point of inflammation, maybe a sentence or two just from your take on in regular, you know, garden variety, I guess, idiopathic Parkinson's, whatever we want to define that as. Um, what is your sense of the role of inflammation? We did have a talk for those folks out there uh, by Malu Tanzi that was really great as well mm -hmm. uh, on this topic. Maybe we can just get Dr. Brendan's um, or Patrick's uh, take on that. So Malu is a leader in this field and she's been pushing this idea with inflammation for many, many years. And We've known since the late 1980s that there's inflammation in the brain in Parkinson's. There's a, a couple of people, uh, doctors McGear and McGear, married couple in Canada, showed that there were inflammatory cells in the brain where the, the neurons die. But I remember this as when I was just doing my PhD. And, and back then we, we thought, okay, well, inflammation, it's a response to the death of nerve cells. It's just a response. It's not a driver. But what has become apparent also of about 10 years or so, total shift, is that the inflammatory changes in Parkinson's might drive the disease process or be an integral part of this, like a vicious cycle. And that evidence comes from many areas, and Malu probably spoke about this, but 
One is if we look at the genetic risk factors for Parkinson's, and there are now 90 places that have been identified in the, in the genome of humans that seem to modulate risk. Many of them sit next to genes that are part of the inflammatory system or immune system and inflammation. So that would suggest that inflammation is important. Then we've also seen that uh, there are uh, several types of inflammatory cells that get into the brain in Parkinson's. And we know from animal experiments, like when we do this uh, Lewy pathology, prion like spreading stuff, if we remove inflammatory cells from mice, we can do this genetically or pharmacologically, we affect the spreading. And it looks like the immune cells are important in modulating the spread of the aggregates. And lastly, and, and I'm sure there are other things one can bring up, but another thing that's recent, there's several papers coming out from a, a variety of groups, recently a group from England, showing that people with Parkinson's disease have different numbers of immune cells in their blood before they get Parkinson's or very early on. So changes in, in, uh, in the white blood cells in the bloodstream. Uh, well, I should add one last thing. So measuring cytokines, you know, these pro-inflammatory chemicals, they are changed in Parkinson's disease uh, and quite markedly so, some of them. So converging evidence that immune system is important. And maybe that can bring me on to my last topic, which would be in the program I mentioned before, where we want to repurpose drugs and try to slow progression of Parkinson's disease by using over-the-counter drugs or things that are in Walgreens and CVS already. Um, some of the drugs that we are trying to promote and put in clinical trials are drugs that can affect inflammation. So, so it's becoming an, I, um, a concept that inflammation could be a therapeutic target. So not just decreasing uh, synuclein aggregates, but perhaps decreasing inflammation, which might then in turn decrease aggregates. How cool. Wow. Um, one other topic, um, and I maybe we could spend a minute, I think there, you know, there's, we could talk all day. And, and I guess the, the gang here loves hearing you talk, actually. And that's not the case. Sometimes they're like, why is this person still talking? Um, they, they write that in the chat, actually, so that they're very happy with what your, your stories are and, and all of this topic. Um, so, uh, What's your sense on environmental kind of um, exposures as well? Maybe just tell us a couple of you know lines about your sense of that. So there's no doubt that there's a genetic component to Parkinson's. So maybe five percent or so actually have a familial inherited form, but the remaining ninety-five percent, the heritability has been estimated in the mid twenties in, in terms of percent. So if you think as we walk around here in, in our lives, we carry genes and and some of them protect us and some of us, uh, some of the genes that, depending on how much we express of them, make us more vulnerable to the disease. But in Parkinson's, it's clear there has to be something else on top of that, because it's, it's evident uh, from genetic studies and um, that other something could be environmental pollutants, could be changes in microbiome that occur because of dietary factors, it could be infections, head trauma. And I saw somebody said that they had had um, a couple of bouts of spinal meningitis. So that's an infection, of course, that could be yeah. something. Yeah. So, so a wide variety of things could potentially trigger the disease in people who are genetically susceptible. And you all know, even those who have a very strong genetic susceptibility, like uh, the LARC2 gene, which is a we, we call it a, a dominant gene. You need one copy of a mutant LARC2 gene and, and you're very likely to get the disease. Even people who carry that gene get the disease at very different ages. And it, it, I can share, it's no secret, right? Say, Sergey Brin, one of the two founders of Google, he has a mutant LARC2 gene. His mother has two copies, both mother's and father's gene. She got Parkinson's, he's now, I guess in his late 40s, around 50. And he doesn't have Parkinson's, the latest I heard. And of course, he may live till he's 80 before he gets it, if he ever gets it. So, so we don't understand, even when it's genetic, if, if that's just a genetic risk that makes it very likely that you need some other insult. 
Great. Well, this is called holistic. Our, our sessions here. And it means that we like to find modifiable things in lifestyle and you know, exercise and you know, mind-body approaches and all kinds of diet and sleep. And maybe in the last few minutes, um, since you're such a knowledgeable sort of um, person on all things research and have had this passion for Parkinson's for so long, maybe tell us your take on sort of what are the maybe five things that you see evidence for in, in sort of wellness approaches that may be beneficial to Parkinson's patients given your reading of the research? So in terms of wellness, let's start with cigarette smoking, which is great because cigarette smoking <laughs> decreases Parkinson risk. Of course, it's not great, but it is a fact. Uh, many studies have said that there is an association between reduced Parkinson risk and smoking. Why? We don't know. And it may actually be because smoking changes gut microbiome. Believe it or not, smoking does that. So that could be a mechanism. A thing that is better and healthier is in this cup. A bit of coffee here. Four cups of coffee per day associated with a reduced risk for Parkinson, reduced Alzheimer risk, reduced type two diabetes risk and so forth. Could also work via the gut microbiome. Who knows? We, we just don't know. And then, of course, I see somebody mentioned exercise. When it comes to people who have Parkinson's, there is a growing body of evidence to suggest that different forms of exercise make people feel better. And I think that's, that's a strong growing body of evidence. We don't understand the mechanism necessarily. Exercise can reduce inflammation. That could be one way. It could also be because exercise might uh, increase growth factors in the brain. There's some animal experiments to support that. Is it possible that exercise, on the other hand, can prevent the disease from ever occurring? Not so clear. I mean, there's some epidemiological evidence suggesting that people who sit at a desk for their work have a higher risk of getting Parkinson than those who have a manual labor, physical works. But it, it's, it's difficult to say. But Coffee is a good idea. Exercise is a good idea. And I, I, you know, healthy diets are probably a good idea. As long as those healthy diets don't contain um, um, exotic bacteria and exotic viruses that we will later find out cause Parkinson's, then healthy diets are not good. Very good. Well, that was pretty good. I think uh, we, we, we're I, it was sort of an out of the box question to somebody who I think doesn't spend a lot of time necessarily counseling patients on this, but I think it's always helpful when we're talking about all the things that they don't have control over, like their genes and environmental exposures and gut processes that happened, you know, many, many years ago to sort of, I think, have some things that give hope um, and what they can do as well. So maybe just in the yeah, last Could, could I ask, uh, yes, just one last thing. So I mentioned Tom Isaacs, the wonderful Parkinson advocate and yeah. who, who was one of the founders of Cure Parkinson's Trust. And I think he did something that was amazing for people with Parkinson's and that was social networking. He was an amazing advocate, but also brought together people. And he started this rallying to the challenge at the Van Andel Institute, which in my mind, that emotional and, and so cognitive support in the sense that people learn from each other is incredibly valuable. And I, I, you know, being emotionally feeling well emotionally is likely to be anti-inflammatory and beneficial. Absolutely. So I think Tom did a lot for a lot of people just by his existence. Yeah, that's amazing. So maybe just in the last um, couple of minutes, uh, Patrick, um, maybe just give us some messages of hope where you see sort of the, the top research kind of ideas. And if you want to talk about, you know, the stem cell thing, because I, I think we that was the one piece that we didn't mm -hmm. really continue down that one uh, path. If, if that's where you'd like to go or, or wherever, I'll give you the last few minutes to again and give hope to our group here who've really enjoyed this uh, hour that's just flown by. People have said amazing comments here, really enjoyed the hour, one another hour. They can listen to you all day, all kinds of things. I mean, it's a very sweet group, which is why, you know, I continue to host this here and, and uh, you know, bring great uh, speakers uh, like you. Um, but yeah, maybe give us a few minutes of, of hope and then pass it back to me and I'll pass it back to Sarah for our final goodbye. So I feel I have a 40 year perspective or more than that, because I was, you know, I remember when my dad was diagnosed and there were no support groups and you know, we knew nobody else who had Parkinson's. So, so I think where should we feel hope? I, I think the fact that there are support groups and communication and exercise programs, very important for the well-being of people who are affected. I think there's tremendous hope with cell transplantation. And I say this having coming out, 
come out of this amazing webinar, six hours in the last 24 hours that I spent with people doing stem cell derived neuron transplants. I'm very optimistic. And, you know, having done it since the 80s, you'd think I'd give up one day. Uh, in fact, our 12 year old son said to me just a few months ago, Dad, you've been doing this for so long, you haven't cured Parkinson's. That's not very good. So I think a 12 year old has an interesting perspective, but I think we should be optimistic. And cell transplants, I really think they will have a role in the future in, in the therapeutic arsenal. I'm also very optimistic that there will be a therapy that slows Parkinson's disease progression. And there are already some hints from so-called phase two trials with anti-diabetic agents and, uh, you know, they're also anti-inflammatory maybe in, in their mechanism of action. Um, I have never in my life seen so many drug companies so heavily engaged in Parkinson's using such a wide variety of approaches that something is going to work. And what we know today compared to 40 years ago, it, it's, you can't compare it. It's totally different, our knowledge base. And it's opened up so many avenues that something is going to work. It just would be crazy if it didn't. That said, I don't know when and I don't know what, because if I knew what, I wouldn't be sitting here. I'd be off doing that thing. <laughs> Well, fabulous. Um, I think, you know, you have lots of love from our group. Hopefully uh, Sarah and her team will pass all of this on. It was very captivating. I mean, you, I can't keep reading this. It's like a lot of positivity and amazing feedback. But what I think, honest, between you and me, Patrick, I think honestly, what we've shown today is that you on camera without any slides and me facilitating, I guess, some questions of, you know, my lack of knowledge of science and, you know, kind of just picking your brain a little bit is a great combination. And I think the patients are really hungry for this. So I would say not to sort of overstep, but that we should have you either back for another hour of this, or maybe make this into something that's more collaborative between, you know, at the, either even at the Van Andel Institute, sort of with you getting to showcase your knowledge, because I know you do have some hosting um, yourself and you've had a number of speakers on with, I know you have patient voices and tell me what that series is. And it's with So Parkinson's. we have a quarterly webinar that we do together with Journal of Parkinson's Disease and Cure Parkinson's and Van Andel Institute. And it's, um, well, the next one is on March 31st, if I'm not mistaken, it's on young onset on, Parkinson's but... disease. So we have a, patient advocate or a patient and, and a couple of people who are experts on this and I just uh, I'm you in that one I'm the moderator right. in that one. Right. So. so we don't get to hear from you that much so I think if we can try to do more of this I think it would be fun and love to twist your arm to do one on more of the social connection and possible mental health stuff for the next one after that on your in your series and love to have you back on this series if there's not a place to collaborate in between then so um, because I think you're you're sort of you have a bird's eye view that's quite interesting, but then also like a ground level view that's quite interesting because of sort of, I think the breadth of people that you have uh, in your world and, and the, the inspiration from your dad. Uh, um, so I think it's really great to sort of hear hear your take and, and uh, there's just so much out there and it can be so overwhelming um, when people get sort of so into the nitty gritty. And, and so I think hearing from you about what really makes sense and where people should be, you know, placing their hopes and uh, energy is really helpful. So thank you so much for spending the time. And, um, and I want to say thank you for mentioning my dad, because it, it makes me tear up because, you know, well, it's 40, what did you say? 40 year anniversary is coming up. So we can, maybe we'll have like a toast to your dad on, on the day. I don't know when it is, but happy to, you know, coordinate that and have a virtual happy hour with you. But I mean, I think we it's all April have... Fool's Day actually that I got the job. And I, I always said, it felt like an April Fool's joke from, from my supervisor, Anders Berkeley, when he said, do you want to become a junior teacher? And I said, I don't know what I'm going to teach. I don't know anything. But there you are. Well, you've obviously taught a lot of people here, so I, I, they will give you your, you know, these these comments, and and it is very inspirational. And I have teared up more than once on this, uh, you know, on this program, and it, it makes it all real, right? Because it really does hit home for all of us. So, so I think, um, thank you for your, you know, real, um, your amazing energy and and your warmth and and just sort of sharing a piece of your honesty and and you know why you do this work with us and happy to have a toast and it's actually you know uh april is uh parkinson's awareness month too so we're, we're always doing some fun things around that as well but thank you for making the time and uh sarah i'm going to pass it back to you for our goodbye wave sounds great and i i concur with what you said indu and we'd love to have you back and 
And, um, and I agree that is why we're in this, right? Because there's a connection and it means a great deal. And it comes through in your passion and your care and concern for this. So it was absolutely a wonderful hour. We're going to send you the, the, uh, the notes because yeah, they will make you feel very good and people really enjoyed it. And thank you all for joining. We promise we heard you. So we will circle back and get you back in here. Would love that. Um, and in the meantime, let's give a great big wave. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. If you open up the screens, you can see all the smiling, happy faces yes. of all our patients out there. It's quite beautiful. Pages and pages. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for thank having you. me. Bye-bye.